a kitchen stove. So I think it's great that we have this opportunity to work in a broader association space, hopefully in a coordinated way, and that this panel today is a first step towards that coordination and seeing how NEMA can help in the process without duplicating what's already being done. So with that, um, I'm always a big favor of alphabetical. I think Dr. Biller, you would be first. All right. Thank you, Fern. Thank you all. We are excited to be here. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Stefan Biller. I'm the CEO of Advanced Manufacturing International, or AMI for short, which is uh, a not-for-profit organization that is dedicated to the digital transformation of small and medium enterprises. Before that, um, I was in charge of product management at IBM for AI and IoT. And prior to that, that, I was a chief scientist and technical director at uh, GE Global Research. And before that, I was at General Motors Global Research. Um, I'm particularly interested in digital transformation. I've been working in this area, uh, smart manufacturing, IoT, and so forth for the last 15 to 20 years, even though we might have not called it exactly that at the time. Um, but I'm very interested in systems optimization and optimization of manufacturing systems in particular uh, to help with throughput quality cost and fulfillment. Um, I've been doing this first in sort of like the long range planning space. You can call it industrial engineering or operations research. But lately, the last 15 years or so, we have been doing this for uh, within the real time space and trying to utilize the data from PLCs, from equipment and so forth uh, to, again, optimize for throughput quality cost and fulfillment. I'm glad to be here and uh, I'm thrilled to be on the on a illustrious panel with uh, Ryan and John. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biller. Uh, John Dyke, if you go ahead next, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm certainly honored to be here with with this august body and with my fellow panelists. Um, my name is John Dyke. I'm the CEO of SESME, the Smart Manufacturing Institute. And for the sake of today's conversation and many others, I would equate simply equate smart manufacturing with advanced manufacturing. And um, um, uh, just briefly on my background, I come from the automation and manufacturing IT industry. I've worked for Rockwell Automation and General Electric in the software and automation side of, of those businesses, kind of working to build software systems and intelligent uh, manufacturing IT architectures to advance the cause of manufacturing here um, in the U.S. and around the world, and had the privilege three and a half years ago of, of uh, joining SESME and um, driving our own sort of journey through how we use federal funds to advance the cause and create a more competitive manufacturing environment here in the U.S. Just briefly, a little bit about SESME. We're one of uh, several manufacturing USA institutes funded by the federal government. Uh, our agency is, our funding agency is the Department of Energy. Um, so what we do is work hard to advance the horizontally across all industries and, and for all manufacturing types. We work hard to advance the cause of um, manufacturing, but try to communicate and, and advocate for, for these ideas across the, um, in, in the domain of energy. And frankly, from our perspective, virtually every, every manufacturing improvement, whether it's uh, uh, on a manufacturing cell somewhere, in a plant or across the supply chain, uh, whether it's more effective asset utilization or supply chain efficiency, or, or simply the OEE on a, on a piece of equipment for a small manufacturer, all of those can be translated into energy efficiency and even uh, energy productivity. And so, so from our perspective, driving a more effective manufacturing process, plant, operation, supply chain is the overarch overarching objective and doing so in a, in a way that we refer to as accelerating the democratization of smart manufacturing reducing cost and complexity for all manufacturers, but 
um, with a specific emphasis uh, working together with Stefan Biller and AMI and others in this space to ensure that our strategies and the, and the investments that we make um, serve to drive down the cost and complexity for small and medium manufacturers. They are kind of, to, to borrow an old phrase, left in the cold, left out in the cold for, for much of the last several decades when it comes to improving their operation using digitization technologies. And, and that's not accept, acceptable and it's not uh, feasible going forward to um, if we're if we're going to work collectively on on creating a more manufa more competitive manufacturing environment, so so the strategies, the education, the technology foundations, um, the collaboration that we're trying to drive both here in the U.S. but also with really important uh, engagements across the the Atlantic, um, with Germany, with Japan, with South Korea, other major manufacturing reg regions, ensuring that we drive a harmonized effort globally around these really, really important areas. And, and last but not least, ensuring that we do what we can to tie these, these uh, business outcomes that manufacturers are striving for in terms of revenue generation and, and productivity and so on, that we work with them to tie these to the grand societal challenges that we face around sustainable manufacturing, around uh, carbon reporting, uh, and, and other grand challenges. So I'll leave it at that. Looking forward to the conversation with you all and uh, looking forward to collaborating with you going forward. Thank you, John. That brings us to you, Mr. Kelly. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to participate. Uh, I am Ryan Kelly. I'm with the Association for Manufacturing Technology, AMT. Uh, AMT is uh, I think over 120 years old at this point. Our members uh, make uh, make, or I would say sell um, some sort of technology that could be a machine, that could be a piece of software that manufacturers use to uh, make their products. Um, we're the group behind IMTS, the International Manufacturing Technology Show. I think that's how most people uh, know um, or sort of have a relationship with AMT. It's one of the world's largest trade show, definitely one of the world's largest show where you can go and see the latest manufacturing technology. Um, it's every other year in September in Chicago. It will be this year. Uh, last time we held this, there was 130,000 people in attendance and $10 billion worth of manufacturing technology was sold. So it really is where industry comes to shop and I think to a large degree where uh, people come to find out about the latest technologies. Beyond just the trade shows that we put on, uh, we're involved in a lot of educational activities, uh, policy development. Um, we're based in D.C. and have good relationships with uh, lawmakers, including other uh, non-profit organizations and sort of quasi-governmental organizations like the Manufacturing Institutes and NIST and the MEP program. Um, and then we've got uh, you know, lots of committees and ways to engage with both our, our members and the end users out in the market. Um, my role at AMT is you know, called sort of the general manager of the San Francisco Tech Lab. Um, what does that mean? Well, I think that AMT, you know, had this point of view that looking at industry, uh, looking at many factories, you know, you go in and it doesn't exactly say uh, state of the art. You know, it doesn't say this is what 2020 manufacturing looks like. And uh, AMT decided to pursue an initiative to um, have some boots on the ground in locations where innovation was happening. And so the first place that they picked was the Bay Area, um, where there are a lot of emerging technology companies here. Uh, maybe the manufacturing industry wouldn't say a company like NVIDIA uh, or Google, for example, is a manufacturing technology company, but they themselves think of themselves as manufacturing technology companies and they see opportunity and they see their um, ability to grow and bring value to these markets without really knowing that there's associations such as ours that exist for no other reason than to help them be successful in the market. So sometimes I describe my role as sort of, you know, being the cultural liaison between the <laughs> high tech emerging technology uh, community and that of the traditional manufacturing community and really trying to find, um, you know, the connectivity there. If you looked at, in, at my LinkedIn profile, uh, it says my role is to bring um, tech to industry faster. 
And uh, that's really how I view the sort of the problem set that I'm working on. Um, I look at the uh, United States industrial base and I, and I uh, or maybe, maybe just let me back up. I, you know, coming out here, uh, I, I didn't set out to be someplace and make innovation happen, right? I came here to, um, to actually push on the other side to make adoption go quicker. There's a surplus of innovation that's happening and the innovation is actually accelerating all the time. Uh, it's something that being here in Silicon Valley, I get to see just the sheer pace of the innovation and the spectrum of innovation that's happening. Uh, meanwhile, the industrial base is uh, not uh, accelerating their adoption of these technologies or not accelerating at the pace that actually is going to allow them to catch up. Um, so, you know, through the things I'm working on, through the things that our association and, um, you know, our allies are working on, I think that this is a really important part to realize, um, you know, how can we sort of tenderize this um, environment and, and make a more favorable environment for particularly small and medium sized businesses to absorb some of these technologies that could make a big impact on their business. So um, that's sort of the way I see things. Thank you. That was just what I was looking for. It helps set up the rest of the conversation. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a softball question. It's the title of the session, so I'm pretty sure all of our panelists are prepared to answer this. Um, I think some of you answered this already a little bit in your introduction, um, but if you want to add a little or um, the question is, what is the current state of advanced manufacturing and what do you see as near mid and long term challenges for the industry. I heard already in the introductions that costs are a big issue for SMEs. I don't know if you have. Want to add to that, John, or if you see other challenges you want to highlight and then we'll ask the other panelists to jump. Yeah, and, and I want to hasten to add that cost and complexity is an issue for all manufacturers. It just happens to be that the larger ones, call them the Fortune 1000 manufacturers, can afford to dress uh, and invest in ways that they need to because of the scale of their operations. So um, cost and complexity is an issue for all, but but the accessibility of, of these digitization technologies and capabilities um, just hasn't been there for the small and medium uh, manufacturers. So so I agree 100% with, with Ryan in saying that innovation um, isn't the, the challenge. In fact, I think innovation is the hallmark of manufacturing here in the US and in other parts of the globe. But uh, um, fundamentally, we've we've 30 years, 40 years of industry 3.0, the third industrial revolution has uh, has brought us to this place where even after 10 years of talking about industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, new technologies, new capabilities, a new day, uh, we're, we're really just propagating the complexity and cost of, of industry 3.0. And, and um, perhaps uh, being a little provocative, but, but it's really been a lot of us, including me over the last decade in, the, in that vendor ecosystem, hearing about, seeing, and understanding that notionally this idea of the fourth industrial revolution is, is important and that we need, as manufacturers, we need to go there as, as value, as part of the value chain and this, as a vendor, we have to go there and we have to invest in there. In that in that space, we we were guilty. We are guilty. We have been guilty of kind of putting the industry 4.0 label on a lot of industry 3.0 methods and capabilities and and approaches and and products. And so, our our perspective here at SESME and and much of the 140 plus million dollars that we're spending over over our life cycle are focused on fundamentally recognizing the constraints that face the vendors, that face the machine builders, that face the systems integrators, that face academia, um, that, that, that face each, each of the key stakeholder sets in this evolution, because it's manufacturers don't do revolution, right? I know industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution is, is a handy buzzword, but it's ne never was going to be a revolution. So this evolution uh, is gonna happen over time. We think it's gonna happen this decade, did not happen in the past decade. But working together as an ecosystem is, is the only way we're going to solve an ecosystem challenge. It's not something any one vendor or machine builder or um, systems integrator um, 
where academia can can push forward themselves. So that's probably a, a lot to, to to sort of capture here, but that's a, a little bit about how we see the, the challenges facing this industry. Let me ask you a quick follow up and then I'll ask the other panelists to jump in. The role for associate associations as you see it is this collecting and sharing and organization of communication regarding challenges. Did I encapsulate that correctly? Absolutely. I think I think there's the 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 legacy or <laughs> I'll say default behavior of of the players in the space that need to to be disrupted that need to need to move forward has been to do what they've always done which is to sort of move towards or, or stay in the proprietary we want to do things the way we've always done them sort of mode and i think organizations like yours and the ones represented on this call here are so essential in recognizing the ecosystem challenges that when the tide floats when the tide rises all the boats float higher and 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 it's it's truly uh, an opportunity for all of us so 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 our role collectively is to advocate for these things um, understand how our business models can can be advanced and and make sure that we're not left behind as, as the industry is disrupted and as the industry moves forward ryan steven do you want to jump in thoughts sure so i i wholeheartedly agree with john um which is usually not a surprise <laughs> we are pretty aligned <laughs> on these um so if you so i i worked 15 years at general motors and I want to say around 2005, we put in advanced uh, advanced uh, plant floor systems into General Motors assembly plants. That would do what people talk about in Industry 4.0. You know, we would connect the, all the all the all the machines. We had um, sort of holistic view of performance measures, throughput, quality, cost, and fulfillment, um, and we would start putting analytics into the plans that would allow us to take advantage of predictive maintenance and so forth bottleneck identification inventory management and all the things that we are talking about today now why could we do that at general motors what well, we were truly 10 years probably ahead of let's say most people and the reason it was really standardization it was because GM had the same robot, the same manufacturing execution system, the same quality system and so forth. This, everything was identical in the roughly 150 plans that General Motors had. And that was the huge advantage of GM at the time. And that's why we could become the, the car company. I think we had like seven out of the out of the 10 most productive plans in North America were indeed North General Motors plans. Surprisingly, I'm sure to most, but you know, Ron Harbour, who measured that externally, would attest to that, and he published a report on that every uh, every year. So it was really that standardization, but that was inside of General Motors, and it was because we had that leverage. Now, there, there are two challenges that we have have to wrestle with. One is not everybody standardizes like that. When I worked for General Electric. We had very different systems in every single plan, and it was in part because GE was a conglomerate and they managed it very decentrally. And so you had to think about how do you put a platform in to to make to make this happen. When I worked at IBM, again, you know, of course now we had like a, a different customers. We had to we had to address different customer needs, and we would have uh, platforms for data integration. But we would address maybe 4,000 clients or so out of the 625,000 uh, manufacturers there are. And so the, the two big problems are, and this is where associations can help, is standardization. And then, it, and, and then it's, it's helping the other 600 or so thousand manufacturers. 98% uh, of them are under 500 people. To, to help them to figure out how can they get standardized data collection systems into their factories? How can we reduce the complexity of those systems, as John said, and how can we reduce the cost? And that's exactly what AMI aims to do. That's our that's our mission. And as a non-for-profit, that's the only thing that we are sort of like have to adhere to. We don't have shareholders. We, have, we don't have VCs. So we can really target that uh, very surgically 
and sesame and others sme comes to mind help us in from the association level to do that and it's really really critical that we bring these small medium manufacturers on board because you know what everybody's talking about these days it's supply chain resiliency and if you have 98 percent of all people not on the industry 4.0 bandwagon because they can afford it or it's too complex you cannot get to supply chain resiliency period and so the federal government as well as the larger companies like general motors would do well in helping their supply base to digitalize and get their operations to a state where they can take advantage of industry 4.0 tools and john you know, as you know, and AMT are developing uh, standards. AMT, for example, has developed MT Connect. I sit on their board of trustees. It's a great standard that helps us to to standardize the data flow that comes out of the, out of machines in principle. And so, uh, we're working in that direction. But I think we should try harder to get faster and i think that's where ryan is probably going to come in and say you can do it better with all the tools from the valley yeah i, I, I i'm actually not uh, yes but i don't actually think that we're we're prepared to do that right i mean i i i have a tech background you know i help build companies that made tech you know to aid this space but but i really you know think like and just looking at the you know the title of this presentation of the you know the 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 near term versus midterm and long term challenges i mean i i, I talk to small me, medium sized manufacturing companies all the time and you know one of the questions i ask them is um you know what are the technologies that you're interested in you know if you could if you could sort of take your pick which are the ones that you think are going to have the biggest impact on your business and they'd say you know right i love technology i'd love to talk to you about technology but i have to get off the phone because you know they're firefighting you know there is the labor issue there is the um the you know needing to work extra hours just to get product out the door to keep the lights on because margins are razor thin um the fact of the matter is that there is a confluence of of problems that they're facing in the near term that make thinking strategically about things like technology, um, new ways of uh, you know incorporating technologies to improve their operations, or thinking about technology as a way that they can uh, revolutionize maybe something that they're doing, adopting a, a, a technology like additive manufacturing that might be a big departure from what they're doing before. They're not really thinking about this because of um, you know the real existential threats that they're facing and you know maybe to use a metaphor it's almost like you, you know american companies were uh, farming and growing their own food for so long and then a mcdonald's opened up you know just down the way and they started getting all their food from there and and you know over time the garden got not so uh it's sort of um wasn't as vibrant and it you know wasn't as um it sort of just got to be ignored and became unkempt but then it's like the mcdonald's uh moved farther and farther away and the line at the drive through got farther and it became maybe less attractive to go to mcdonald's and then they turn back to their garden and they realize that it's full of weeds and it's there's not so much food there and so <clears throat> the near-term problem that you know we have is like well the garden is sort of a mess and that's not something that necessarily has a near term solution. And so the near term problems that we face are ones that are sort of decades in the making and they're not going to resolve overnight. And as much as I'd like to think that technology can just step in to the rescue, um, unfortunately, the solutions to these problems, even just getting the technology in, are going to take a really long time. And there's a certain order of operations that needs to uh, occur over years. And that involves policy, it involves education, it involves um, economic incentives and frameworks that allow the adoption. And then it really, you know, more than anything is going to require that, you know, the, the customers of these of, of our industrial base, the industrial base being made up the majority of small, medium sized manufacturing companies. There's got to be some incentive that says we need to invest in and work with companies here 
and not put all these investments, um, you know, in in foreign countries. So that's a really complicated problem. And so it's it kind of seems to me like the hardest of these, you know, the near term, midterm and long term, the hardest ones to solve are actually here at the midterm, just because the problems that we have right in front of us took so long to develop in the first place. So, um, you know, I'm actually much more optimistic about, you know, things that we can do in the, in the medium and long term, um, because I, I feel like we're sort of good at that. Uh, you know, sort of painting a vision of what we want in the future and then taking the steps there. Unfortunately, we weren't really thinking about that 30 years ago, um, you know, when sort of the financialization of our um, uh, industrial base and our strategic advantage in manufacturing start to um, seem not as important um, compared to, you know, being able to source things cheaply and get short term economic returns in the stock market and things like that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Can I add an important nuance to that, Fern? Um, one of the really interesting dynamics, and, and I really appreciated both of those responses as well. One of the important nuances that we have we sort of really were surprised by doing our analysis here of the manufacturing marketplace in the U.S. was that fully 90 percent of all manufacturing sites in the Fortune 1000 environment would be considered small, medium manufacturers if they weren't part of a large corporation. In other words, if you look at a GM or a Procter & Gamble or a General Mills or a Johnson & Johnson, 90% of their fleet of plants are small, medium plants in isolation. And frankly, the, the cost and complexity of the types of things we're talking about make their way into the big plants because that's where the biggest opportunity and the and the return on investment and cost justification can take place. But but frankly, their small medium plants are in many ways um, constrained in the same ways that both Stefan and, and Ryan have articulated. They 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 struggle. And and so I think the 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 really compelling opportunity for us as we move this set of goalposts forward and, and work together and collaborate to solve some of these difficult challenges. The real opportunity is is um, is to bring this entire ecosystem forward because those small medium manufacturing plants, they're suffering from the same sort of um, lack of competitiveness challenges or or just competition uh, because they historically have not reached that threshold of of uh, return on investment because of where we are as an ecosystem. And so anyway, I think that's a, an important piece that I think brings us all closer. We Most of the large comp corporations at, at NEMA and at SESME and at, at um, AMI and, and uh, uh, AMT, they have large deep pockets, but they also have massive organization, a massive part of their organization that are really interested in seeing us address this problem for their small and medium plants too. Yeah, and I think I think John, that that's where standardization plays such an important role, because we, you know, believe it or not, we could put it into every what we develop, we could put into every single General Motors plant. But the reason was that the processes and the technology was identical, and so the additional cost there was no additional cost to write software because you could use the exact identical piece of software in every single plant, just because they had made it so that it was identical. I mean, even the robots, the Fanuc robots, were this, it wasn't just, they were Fanuc robots. No, they were, they, were, they were three or four robots and they were specifications of those robots that were prescribed to a degree that made it easy to just uh, copy from one plant to the next. And General Motors, as you said, they had the pockets deep enough and they had IT organizations and controls organizations that would drive that forward and would not allow that somebody deviated from the standard. By the way, I worked in research and development at the time. I hated it because it I, I saw it as like preventing innovation, you know, by locking stuff down where they said, no, 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 this has to be by the standard. You cannot put anything additional here and so forth. So, you know, there were some, there were a few downsides from it, but. I will admit when I left General Motors and, and, and went on to see other companies who were great in many other ways, General Motors really had it licked in that, in that regard. They really had done a great job at that. And that allowed them to put in innovation that had a negative ROI on plan one 
and maybe plan two, but a vastly positive ROI on plan three to 150. And that's just how that's just how it worked. Now the question is, how can you get to that kind of level at a very heterogeneous okay. environment? And um, you, you know, Ryan, I think you 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 should take more credit for AMT's MT Connect standards development because I think that is a fabulous way uh, of of helping machine tool makers such as Mazak, who now puts as as no there's there's no Mazak machine that gets delivered without MT Connect. It allows their customers to take advantage of some of these IoT tools that the market is developing. And I think collectively, I'm a little more optimistic than you are, I, I think. I think we can do a lot short term. We can't do the fan, the real fancy stuff short term, but we can do basic data collections, standardizing on that, standardizing on machines, on PLCs and so forth, that would allow us to set sort of like set the base uh, to visualize those data and then from there on figure out how we can use artificial intelligence machine learning and all the other stuff that the world is giving us use that um to to improve the key performance indicators that's what that's why we cannot hear you Fern. you're you're on mute Thank you. I have a new cat and she's quite chatty and I wanted to, <laughs> to spare you all her input on this. Um, I wanted to jump in and remind the audience that this is like the rest of today is interactive. I have I think these three speakers are fascinating and I have a stack of questions to ask them, but I am the moderator, not the owner of the panel. So this is your conference and your panel as well. So I want to remind you to raise your hands, use the chat window. Thank you, Bruce. First one in, go ahead with your question. You're very welcome. Uh, especially want to capitalize on the numerous references made to ROI uh, uh, in the challenge to advanced manufacturing uh, with a topic that we were uh, just discussing before this segment began. And that is that it would be great if we had the equivalent of an independent organization or a third party organization such as any of yours uh, that could actually put some thought into a in developing a tool an roi tool for advanced manufacturing especially uh you know targeted to the targeted to SMEs, where it was more uh obvious in, in terms of okay this is where you can save money. This is how it will pay for itself uh, over over a period of time. Uh, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the big boys, so to speak, you know, the GMs of the world, the Teslas of the world, you know, they get it. Frankly, they wouldn't be able to get a product out the door if it was not for advanced manufacturing. I mean, they 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 understand it. Uh, but uh, for for a small to medium sized company. It's a bigger challenge, and being able to have something uh, that that includes numerous factors, you know, uh, the degree of uh, energy efficiency, uh, production efficiency, of needing to uh, uh, being able to get by with less people, not necessarily in a negative way that hey, you can lay off ten people, uh, but rather you can continue to grow. Uh, and you can deploy those resources in a more productive way, you know, in other facets of your operation. Uh, you know, the good old tie-in, especially, you know, John, with the, you, the, your organization and the tie-in uh, to DOE. Good old carbon footprint models, energy efficiency. I mean, people represent a carbon footprint, you know, in, in and of itself. Uh, I, I mean, I think there are just so many exciting variables that could be used, and I'm not really asking or, or proposing uh, uh, for a standard per se, uh, but a uh, uh, but a unbiased tool, you know, that's not coming directly from a manufacturer that helps demonstrate to these companies why this investment should be made and uh, how quickly it can pay for itself. And when you throw in uh, what uh, you know may be available uh, in terms of 
grant monies and fundings to just you know rapidly uh, uh, make that ROI even more attractive, uh, you know that just feeds to it. And I, I, I guess I have a question: A, do you folks have a tool like that, or B, is there anything that is being developed or could be developed? And do you agree that this would be a doable uh, 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 type of a creation? I'd be happy to respond to that. Uh, I think that's such an important piece because um, before you can even determine that this is something that you can justify or that there is an ROI for, you have to you have to have a credible way of determining in what dimension do we do we investigate spending our capital funds to to improve. And and as as uh, Ryan pointed out, there there's there's many many ways. Well, there's many ways any any manufacturer is going to determine where to best deploy their capital. So so both GE and Rockwell in my previous life, we we had, in fact, I had funded the creation of a, a return on investment tool and a methodology that goes with it. But to your point, Bruce, um, we did it as a vendor because nothing else existed. And because it was ours, it wasn't trusted. Um, I could I could speak for it even retroactively to say that it was math. It was it was looking at all of the, the appropriate issues in terms of whatever dimension you wanted to drive your improvement methodology, asset utilization, reduce waste, improve yield, drive OEE, asset performance management, whatever that whatever that value proposition was that you were looking for, we had the the, the return on investment methodology to go there, but it wasn't it was a vendor perspective. And so um, in the last couple of weeks, we've actually in November, we just introduced our first um, vendor agnostic comprehensive business strategy assessment tool it's on our website we're making it's a very uh, we we believe a very important compelling tool to help uh, the initial version is for small and medium manufacturers um, but uh, it, it is absolutely um, being extended into an industry-centric uh, set of uh, extensions as well as uh, large enterprises uh, by industry um, and so the next the next phase we're actually working on the it, it comes up with a bunch of recommendations in five or six different dimensions and and then the question is how do you actually what is the the value of going from where I am and in my maturity in this particular dimension to the next level of maturity and then the ROI on top of that so um, if there are others here that want to partner with us to drive that forward we're 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 actively investing investing in this piece but know again that um, there are many dimensions and many possible ways that this uh, um, this could be um, built collectively and ensured ensure that we have the best possible tool for the industry okay thank you great i think that uh, that trust element yeah. uh, you're right on because yes i mean many of us have those types of tools that we use to give to our customers but i just also know from a from the perspective of you know our companies being a customer to other technology when you get get it proposed that way i mean right off the bat you know shields are up where you you've got to take it with a grain of salt and yep. to have something that had the weight of an organization behind it that you know i i would concede uh, uh you know actually some of the points that you just brought up i mean you've got to go it's not a simple basic ROI tool. I mean, you do have to you have to start with the questions, uh, 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 you know, that drive, you know, the nature of uh, of your company and uh, uh, you know the their expenditures and you know what what makes sense and and so you know there's just so much that's got to happen beforehand. But I just think the power of something like that would be great for the industry as a whole. Um, so yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, I mean, John is doing a fantastic job at that and basically developing not only the standards for a platform, but also, you know, the lighthouses that they're developing at SESME that basically say, hey, you know, look here, here, here's our, here, here's the calculator we used on this particular problem for this company. And so then you have an example of how you could use it, you know, and you can go in a priori, we determine here's what the ROI was. In the end, here's what we got. And, you know, you've got to be honest with yourself. How close did you get, right? And so sometimes you might not get too close, and that's okay, and you improve your tools that way. But, uh, you know, I think that's really critical 
that, you know, in terms of trust that organizations such as SASME could help their constituents in saying like, yeah, look here, this is a, a trusted tool and we have, we have used it 20 times and, you know, here's the spread and here's the variation of how good we were. Uh, I think that's very helpful. I'll chime in just to say that I agree with that as well. I think that, you know, this is um, people. Just, um, this is not widely shared information, and so it takes a long time for there to be sort of an accepted um, conception, con con sort of conceptualization of what the ROI, uh, what that ROI might be, what the ROI period might be for any given technology. And I can, you know, certainly I think our members would benefit from more uh, open uh, openness in um, the sharing of that type of data. Um, I think it could only help um, the, it, it would help both sides. It would help end users because they would have more confidence in the adoption of these technologies It would help them plan. But I, I can't imagine a scenario where it really doesn't help also all of the solution providers who would be able to uh, make sales more easily. I don't think it, I don't think that there's a downside at all and you know i don't think um yeah i think it's a worthwhile uh a worthwhile thing to explore and to the extent that we can be helpful in such a thing you know i think that we would definitely participate for the benefit of our members and the benefit of the industry thanks for all of those thoughtful answers i'm going to jump in with another question of my own but i want to remind the audience to please keep raising your hand or if you don't want to speak, you can put it in the chat window and I'll be happy to pose your question to the panelists. Um, I want to return to, um, I don't know if you were present in our previous session, we did an open Slido survey uh, uh, interaction with the participants and one of the questions we asked them was what they thought the most important priorities were. The same question I've asked all of you. And uh, nearly half of them said that it was international standardization. And I know that NEMA has an MDCP grant for standardization, and that's so something that we want to work on. Um, but give us any thoughts you have about what that standardization roadmap might look like, what the different players already are, any pointers or directions you want to give us as we launch into that process? Yeah, I would be happy to chime in here and make another plug for MT Connect. So <laughs> I would start I would start with that. And, you know, Doug Woods, who's the president of AMT, I think he over over five ish years or so, maybe even longer, uh, he has been investing his own money into it, you know, starting, I think, around 2010 or so. GE put in put in money along with a couple other big players, and I think that 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 is certainly something that we should look at. How can we how can we get standards at the machine tool builders at the let's call it at the origin of the data? The more standardization we can get there, the better we'll be off. And then of course you have OPC UA and many other things, and I'm mm -hmm. almost certain that John could give you a map of all those standards and what they do and where they're useful and where we have holds. Um, I think really the critical piece is to think about what does that mean for small and mediums? And I, I think too often you end up with standards that are so complex and nebulous that none of the small mediums can even read them and do anything with them. So. So what I would encourage you, Fern, is I would say, well, 98% of all of our of, of all of our manufacturers are small mediums. Uh, make that your constituents. Make that the people who say that's a, that, that's helpful and, and that's not. And I think that that would go a long way. And then the other advice I would give is, you know, link it to the major standards like OPC UA and MT Connect and 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 others that are out there to make sure that they don't contradict it. They could simplify it, but they shouldn't contradict it. My father, yeah. quote I loved, he said the 
beauty of standards is there are always so many to choose from. <laughs> yeah. So, so Stephen, um, this is John Talon. Um, I was involved in the early stages of the formation of M MT Connect, and I was extremely impressed at the widespread adoption within the industry, particularly at the machine tool vendors. A lot of the machine tool vendors yes. already had their proprietary data interfaces to their systems, not just the decode feed, but literally the feedback loop. And and from their perspective, you know, they jumped on board MT Connect. And as far as I'm aware, most, if not all, of the major machine tool vendors um, offer an MT Connect capability. Again, the expectation or the the objective of MT Connect was this notion of a system wide plug and play of data interoperability. And it's expanded even beyond just machine tools. So there's a wide variety of of uh, manufacturing devices now that actively support MT Connect. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday about let's not reinvent the standards. Let's let's understand what the landscape is. Let's see what's out there and let's let's put together an an ecosystem map that identifies these different la layers of standards and capabilities so that we can really focus on the real gaps and and the, the opportunities to further enhance and, uh, and advance, you know, this notion of an enterprise-wide data transparency across our system. And and again, I think MT Connect is a great example of a standard that exists out there. Um, I've been involved with the ISO Step organization, where they've also been creating data models that have been um, in effect some going back decades in practice that we could leverage. Um, but again, let's not let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's let's look out into the you know the standard world and see what can effectively be pulled into play. I well well said, both of you, and and I would just want to pile on to say uh, well a couple of Brief nuances first. Stefan, when you said initially that one of GM's core strengths over the long haul was in standardization, I'm glad you said standardization, not standards. And the, the only reason I want to make that nuance or articulate that is that um, standards are important where they exist and where, they're and where they uh, are adopted. Um, we, from our perspective, are advocating for a specific set of standards that we think will, will are right for the idea of democratizing smart manufacturing, reducing cost and complexity. But we're also building some things, some tools that we're giving back to the industry that we aren't calling a standard because it takes a decade to build a standard and we don't have time for that, nor does industry have time for that. So, so the market will speak and like they have for MT Connect, um, will endorse these things or not. Um, but but fundamentally, one of the, one of the key areas of standardization that we are focused on together with the our friends in Germany with the platform industry 4.0 and with Japan and with South Korea are really an extension of the um, ideas that MT, MT Connect has really delivered on for the machine tool community. Not that it's exclusively there, but that's where it was born and that's where it came from and that's sure. where most of the adoption has, has come from. And that is the standardization of information models, not just for new machines that have the intelligent front end that can um, articulate who they are and what data they have and then make that available to an application, but for a brownfield environment as well, so that uh, we can work with um, the VDMA Association out of out of Europe, who's who's got 15 full-time staff building standard information models, expressing them as OPC companion specifications. We can extract the node set from those companion specifications and turn those into profiles that literally anybody can use for that class of machine. Or if I'm a subject matter expert somewhere and I'm, I know how to implement a packaging line or a paper converting machine or a calendar on a, a pulp machine, I can create that profile, that information model, put it in our marketplace and make it available to a thousand others that have that kind of equipment. All of that drives, it's, it's, it's crowdsourcing, it's a modern version of standardization, which is crowdsource 
adoption and crowdsourced adoption of these types Connect and, and Jonathan Wise from SESME talking about interoperability on a panel uh, or with each other. Um, these ideas are so important, we believe, to democratize smart manuf advanced manufacturing, smart manufacturing. It's the it's the reducing of cost and complexity so that anybody can afford to begin there and get get, get on that bandwagon, get started on that journey and move forward. Agreed 100%, nothing to add. <laughs> Brian, I saw you nodding a few times. Did you remember? Yeah, I just, you know, I think actually MT Connect has been in development 11 years. Okay. And it's uh, cost several millions of dollars to get to this point. And I remember when I first got involved with it before I was at AMT about probably seven years ago. And uh, I have to say, Hearing all of this praise and enthusiasm for MT Connect now, I mean, really makes me feel like we've accomplished something really good. Because back in the early days, it was difficult to convince the equipment manufacturers that this is something that they should embrace. Uh, just like all kind of standard development around data and the sharing of data, you know, their concern is that they might be missing out on something if they just give all their data away you know there might be some opportunity for them um i think that the game changer for us and like i think a good lesson for any anyone involved in, in standards is um you know what changed their mind uh, all of the customers and all the end users that were involved in the formation of the standard that basically said we well, think of all the cool things that we could do if you just adopted this standard and it was that participation of the end user community, the early adopters, the you know forward thinkers that um, I think really uh, turn the tides. But you know one thing's for sure, um, and MT, MT Connect has I think done a fantastic job of this. Uh, any standard is 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 built by you know largely by volunteers, largely by people that care and and are are willing to put in the sweat equity. Um, and now you see 11 years later what the impact of that could be is that, you know, now there are hundreds of, of uh, equipment manufacturers that are embracing the MT Connect standard and tens of thousands of uh, implementations and active daily uses of that standard in industry. Um, so it, it, it takes a while for it to take off, but then at a certain point, the network effects take off and then you can see how um, vital and how much of a value creator you know, having these interoperable standards can be in in creating, you know, downstream innovations and, and, and new value. So um, it's uh, I, I would say it is difficult, right? This is a is a, a, a always a challenge, but it's it's certainly worthwhile. And I think that MT Connect is a great case study to to look at how this is made and what the benefits can be if you persevere and, and actually um, try to achieve such things. So, so Ryan, going back to the the MT Connect uh, inception, you know, mm -hmm. um, the organizers compared it to the standardization of screw thread, that it would mm -hmm. have have a comparable impact on the manufacturing industry as that. And I think, in reality, it really is showing that it, that it is having a significant impact. You know, signing on the machine tool manufacturers. You know, one of the, the key issues that they were concerned about was the level of exposure of their proprietary information uh, of their machine tools. So, for example, right. the acceleration and deacceleration curves of their motion control system. Right. No, no way, no how they wanted that to get exposed to, you know, to this interface. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are very reasonable elements of data that can be collected at the machine tool that can be made accessible through MT Connected, but, you know, they don't have any problem serving that up. Um, and if they can leverage a standard like MT Connect and provide their customers with, you know, more widespread value, 
than their own proprietary interfaces, which they all offered, well, you know, you know, so much the better. Um, the one thing that I find interesting is that the role of MT Connect still hasn't been fully realized yet or the benefit of MT Connect. For example, I'm unaware of any CAM systems that currently communicate with the machine tool environment to pull the configuration parameters of a machine tool into their environment to kind of pre-configure uh, target machines. I, I'm unaware of any, any CAM system that has that type of interface pulling that type of configuration data from the machine tool. But that's certainly an opportunity as well. And again, I think having this, this standardized mechanism and interface really opens up the potential for those types of widespread advances across the manufacturing industry. Thanks for that. I see that we just have a few minutes left and Megan Hayes had a question, so I'd like to invite her to speak. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And if you thought that I was going to uh, let the uh, standards discussion go by and stay silent, obviously you don't know me very well. <laughs> nice to meet you all. I'm, I'm Nima, Senior Finn. Technical Director. I've been doing standards for a long time. I think I started when I was like 12, but um, wow. I'm sharing, yeah, I'm sharing on the screen um, an image that uh, my former colleague Kirk Anderson sent me yesterday. And I think it's really interesting that the vast majority of these other kind of roadmaps are these kind of layered images. And the USA NIST standards roadmap looks like a tornado. And I'd be interested to hear from each of you which you think is a more accurate picture of what a standardization roadmap for advanced manufacturing looks like. Well, it seems to me, you know, that the NIST is reality yeah. and <laughs> the rest is what we would like to see. I think that's that's probably an accurate description. I think what you want to do when you're developing standards is not to be all encompassing. You might have an all encompassing view in your head, but the real key is to say, you know, let's take empty connect. Oh, we're going to take, you know, these type of machine tools and we will now have a standard for that particular piece. And then, you know, if you look at their roadmap, then say, well, after that, we're going to take that type of machine tool. And then we're going to go to, you know, metal fabrication or whatever it is, right? But each time you fill out a little box in that chart that is helpful as quickly as possible. I think that's the key to make that operational as quickly as possible, even if it's narrow, that's okay. Um, and then you expand from there. And you know what you know the MD Connect guys have also done is when there was a let's call it a competing standard coming up on the horizon, they would actually go and talk to the people who were putting that standard out there and say, hey, look, we have no ego here. You can have all this. We're going to give it all to you. Let's just make sure that we don't develop competing standards and maybe it saves you some time. And I think that's a critical attitude for a successful standard that this says, it doesn't have to have my name on it. It doesn't have to, you know, it can be, if, if you want to call it something else in France, but it's our stuff underneath and you just copied that all, great, all the power to you, that's really what you want. So it's that kind of um, standard development mindset, I think that you need to have at the leadership level. Because as we know, there are some people who sell standards. Once you, once you get to selling standards, I think you're missing the boat. <clears throat> and clearly there, there, there are some areas that are historical, yes, you want to sell standards and so forth, that makes sense. But in the industry 4.0 environment, because it's all based on systems and systems optimization, that doesn't make any sense. So having been involved, 
So having been involved with the ISO STEP uh, standardization committee, the worldwide working groups, you know, I can certainly attest to the fact that, you know, that type of standards effort is glacier in its movement. Um, there's an advantage to that. Um, sure. I think what's been important is that it provides an operational framework. And, and Seth did a very, very good job of establishing the data dictionaries, the application protocols, the various conformance classes and whatnot across key industry segments. And I certainly have a great affection for for that approach and the rational rationality of that approach. Um, unfortunately, like many have already said, I think the reality of our environment looks more like the, the NIST picture. Um, as much as you would like to rationalize and, and structure it, there, there are so many different uh, constituents in the space that are pulling and and positioning their their own perspective, you end up with something that looks like NIST rather than something that is as well structured as the the ISO set uh, model. Thanks for that. I think we need to wrap up the panel. I'd like to get give each of our panelists just a minute or two with the audience's indulgence for any final thoughts they have, and then we're going to take a break. I'm happy to start. So, so I would just say briefly that um, the last decade, the, the specifically the decade where Industry 4.0 was introduced in 2011, um, we've seen for the first time in recorded history, we've seen a, a, a fall, a decline, a plateauing, and then a decline in manufacturing productivity by worker here in the U.S. So the four, three point eight to four trillion dollars of value creation promised by the fourth industrial revolution, um, frankly, didn't materialize. And I think deeply understanding deeply why that hasn't happened and addressing the root cause of of those constraints is really important for us. And I and I and I would just make an appeal to this ecosystem representing such a great collection of organizations that that are playing in this space that have the the power in their hands to engage or disengage from this evolution towards a more competitive future and towards the sort of transformation that this industry really desperately needs to kind of st stem the offshoring and, and, and facilitate the reshoring if, if that's indeed something we can do. Um, we, we have to do that collectively. And, and um, we believe that the business model for each of the stakeholder groups that that's vital for that disruption and for that transformation um, looks much, much better in a, in a world where the velocity of adoption of advanced manufacturing or smart manufacturing dramatically accelerates, where there's a bigger pie for everybody, and, and that the proprietary approach to not engaging in this col collaboration to move the industry forward um, will, will um, represent uh, a, a static business model for you and prevent you from actually engaging in that kind of value creation. So I, I don't mean to end on a negative note. I want to just be positive in saying um, this ecosystem is a vital part of seeing this industry move forward and uh, would love to work with you to, to help facilitate that. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo John. And uh, it's funny that he started with the uh, four trillion dollars because that's always where my mind goes in 2015, uh, you know, and I think just renewed a couple of months ago, uh, our esteemed colleagues from McKinsey came out with, you know, these these estimates <laughs> and they and they confirmed them as essentially even in 2021 that this is the value that is out there. And I have no doubt that they're right. Right. The The, the question is, how can we get. And the, but the reason we have not capitalized on that to a larger degree, which they also uh, agree to in their 21 update, is that we haven't focused on the system enough. We have focused on components of the system, 
um, and we have made great progress in, let's say, uh, predictive maintenance and so forth. There are hundreds of vendors today that help you with that, and that's very valuable. But we have failed to look at what is the larger system, both in the factories and then in the supply chains. And if we really want to unlock that value, that's where we have to go. To unlock that value, you have to include your small, medium manufacturers. That will require uh, tools that are low cost and not complex. And everything that John and Ryan have said today, I think will play in that direction. And I am convinced that we can make this work. Um, but we have to think of it very differently than we ever thought before, because as John said, it's an ecosystem and ecosystem means there's no, uh, there's no power, there's no ownership. It will all be collaborative and it will be up to us to figure this out as sort of like a new organizational model. Ryan, the pressure's on last comments. You're muted. We can't. Such, that would be such a good place to, to end it. Um, but I'll 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 muck it up anyway. So I mean I, I would say this has been a really good uh, conversation. I really enjoyed uh, participating in it and, and hearing uh, the panelists and the audience feedback as well. I mean one one thing that I'll say it's an observation that I've made. Um, in sort of the unique vantage point that I get to sit in about you know technology adoption is that. Um, there's a lot of people that have said you know oh the AI revolution is coming to manufacturing and that's sort of they said that for I think more than a decade now and it's not really happening and, and one one reason that I, I think that it, it is maybe hampering this progress is that you don't really get AI until you've got the nice clean tidy data in the cloud and you don't get that unless you've got good systems in place and sensors on the machine and you don't get that if you don't have like the basic IT infrastructure in the factories. And you don't get that unless you've, you know, got sort of a more educated uh, community there. And, and also they need broadband too, and up-to-date PCs. And so I, I kind of look at this as like, a, you know, there being an infrastructure component to this as well. And I think a, a, a sane place to, to start that might not be as, um, you know, intimidating as some of the topics that we were talking about today uh, would be just simply advocating for the, the types of um, uh, things that would just put those building blocks in place. You know, broadband for every factory in America. You know, that may be a good place to start. You know, incentives to make sure that many small, medium-sized manufacturing companies get access to the basics. Cybersecurity, up-to-date PCs, you know, the ability to buy the latest software, um, in, in, including all the, you know, the um, ability to retool with, uh, new machine tools and robots and 3D printers and things like that. But I mean, I think really uh, trying to understand what the role of just that basic infrastructural piece, broadband, cybersecurity, and what that might do to further this along is I think, you know, something that doesn't get enough discussion. So maybe that's my contribution. And, and thanks so much for, uh, for allowing me to participate. This was great. Very good. I'm offering some virtual applause to all of our panelists. I want to thank them for joining us this morning. And I want to turn this back over to Megan if she wants to say any words of or organizational words or otherwise before we go to break. Yep. Thanks, Fern. And, and thanks, Ryan and John and Stefan. I really, really enjoyed that session. And I learned a lot and I'm sure our members did too. So um, stay tuned. You, this is not the last you'll hear from NEMA on this. I'm sure that we will be partnering with each of you for different aspects of this as, as time goes on because it's so important to our members and to manufacturing in the U.S. So um, you are welcome to stick around and join us for the rest of the program, but we understand your schedules are busy if you can't stick around. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Bye. So right now for, for everybody, we're going to take a brief break, um, about 20 minutes until 12.45. And uh, for those of us on the East Coast, this is, you know, our lunch break. And, and for everybody else, you know, please take the time to walk away from your computer and stretch your legs and all of that. When we come back, we will be going into what I'm calling the open discussion point of view and I've opened a new poll on Slido so please um, head over there and answer that question the best that you can because I think it's really going to help us to kind of frame 
the discussion that we'll have after this lunch break. And with that, I'm going to let everybody go and I'll see you back here at 1245.